And at the end of the presentation, you should be able to answer the following questions. What was the timeline of the sequence of events during the first Passover? In the church for many, many years, the church has been back and forth between whether the Passover happened early on the 14th of Nisan or whether it was late on the 14th of Nisan going into the 15th. So we're going to look at some of the issues surrounding that debate. We should also know what is the significance of the Passover historically and currently. We want to know if Jesus fulfilled the Passover, which he did, then why do we still continue to observe this particular festival? All the other festivals, one will say, have futuristic meaning and implication. But if Jesus fulfilled the Passover by his crucifixion, yet we continue to keep it, why? Is the Lord's Supper the same as the Passover? Or is it a different observance altogether? Of course, the Jews keep their Passover on the 14th, going into the 15th, and we observe our Passover, also known as the Lord's Supper, on sunset, beginning the 14th. Is it the same observance, or are we missing the true Passover? How often should we keep the Lord's Supper? This is another matter of contention among the churches. Some observe it quarterly, the Adventists I gather. Some observe it every week, and some observe it pretty much every day. But how often does the Bible say we should observe the Lord's Supper? Of course, why do we keep our Passover beginning on the 14th, when the Jews keep theirs at the end of the 14th, going into the 15th? The matter of the night to be much observed, what is that all about? And why do we observe it in the church of God? And finally, what is the future significance of the Passover and the days of unleavened bread? We'll briefly touch on that. So grab your notebooks, grab your Bibles, because we are about to go on a journey into the past, into the Passover, and a bit into the future. So this presentation will be broken into four sections. The majority of the time, we will look at, we'll set the foundation by looking at the Old Testament Passover and the days of unleavened bread. We'll then transition and look at the New Testament Passover, what we know today as the Lord's Supper and the days of unleavened bread. We'll examine the significance or the symbolism of the Passover and unleavened bread, both in the past, the present, and in the future. And we will look at the practical ways that we observe the festival today, as we will do commencing in the next two weeks. Shall we begin? I want us to turn our Bibles to Exodus 12. We're going to spend quite a bit of time here because we want to set the foundation for what the Passover is all about. And this Exodus 12 is a very pivotal scripture to understanding the Passover. And I want us to take some time during this season to go through Exodus 12. I've been through it several times over the past few weeks to get the different points, to get the different inferences, which I'm going to summarize here in the interest of time. So in verse 1 to 2, we see the Lord commanding Moses to tell the nation Israel, who are still in bondage in Egypt, that this is the first month, the month of Abib, or the month of Nisan. And that, in verse 3 and 4, they should choose a lamb or a kid on the 10th tenth, the tenth day of the month. Now, it could be from the flock or from the herd, meaning they could choose a sheep or they could choose a goat. So that's an important thing to note. The animal had to meet some specific criteria. Had to be one year old. Couldn't take a two-year-old lamb or two-year-old goat 
and sacrifice had to be one year old. It had to be without defect. You had to take your best year old sheep or goat and sacrifice it or offer it to the Lord. In verse 6 and 7, we're told that they should slaughter them at twilight. Now, twilight is a very interesting term. And if we were having a question and answer, I'd ask you to tell me what you think twilight means. We have a different, we all have different interpretations of twilight. But the Hebrew phrase used here that is translated as twilight is ben ha, ben ha arbaim. Ben ha arbaim. And it is translated more accurately to say between the evenings. So they're asked to slaughter the lambs between the evenings on the 14th and to put the blood on the doorposts of their homes. In verse 8 to 11, they were then instructed to roast and eat the lambs on that very night after they would have, sli they would have slaughtered them and to have it with unleavened bread, to have it with bitter herbs. And then... They weren't supposed to leave any until morning. So if anything was left over, it was to be burnt up completely. And they were also instructed to eat it in a haste. Because it is the Lord's Passover. So it's not one of those meals that you sit down and, you know, savor. I mean, I like lamb. Whenever I go to Mediterranean restaurants, I always order the lamb. And I take my time and I savor. But they were instructed to eat, in a, eat it in a haste. And the Lord said that on that very night, when they would have eaten this Passover meal, that he would pass through Egypt and that he would strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. If they were not in a dwelling where there was the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. They were further instructed to commem commemorate, to hold a sacred assembly every year. This was something they were to do annually. And for seven days, they were to eat bread made without yeast. From the first day, that is the evening after the 14th day, to the seventh day of this new feast that God was introducing to the Israelites, the days of unleavened bread. Continuing in Exodus 12, verse 17, it says, Celebrate the feast of unleavened bread, because on this very day, I brought your divisions out of Egypt. So this is a clear statement that the Israelites left Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread. That is the 15th of Nisan. And I should ask, can everyone see this from the back? Can't see it from the back. Okay. So I'm just going to continue to read through. Verse 29, we skipped a few verses. At midnight... The Lord struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, as he said he would. So the dead angel passed through at midnight and struck down all the firstborn in Egypt. And during that night, Pharaoh told them to leave. He pushed the Israelites out, saying, Go, leave us in a hurry, lest all of us should die. And so in verse 35 they, to 36, they, the, the Israelites plundered the Egyptians, who God had made favorably disposed. To them. In other words, they, they willingly gave up their possessions to the Israelites as they were, supposedly, as they were leaving Egypt. And the Bible tells us in verse 37 of Exodus 12 that over 600,000 men, Israelite men, not counting the women, not counting the children, not counting the foreigners, those who came as well, along with them, traveled from Egypt from Ramesses to Sukkoth. And we see an important instruction here, that the foreigners who were among them had to be circumcised before they could eat any of the Passover. And it had to be eaten in the home, not on the outside. So it had to be in your home when you ate the Passover meal. You could not be on the outside. So Exodus 12 lays the foundation 
for the first or the Old Testament Passover and days of unleavened bread. And Exodus 13 continues to talk about the days of unleavened bread. It says, Consecrate your firstborn male and animal. So once the Israelites left Egypt, they were instructed to consecrate their firstborn male. Remember, God had just struck down all the firstborn male of the Egyptians and the animals as well, not only the people. And God said, consecrate your firstborn. In other words, separate them for me. The firstborn of your household should be mine. And they had to offer a sacrifice for the firstborn of their household. And the firstborn animal, they had to kill the firstborn animal um, as a sacrifice to the Lord. And they were to commemorate this day, the first day of unleavened bread, as the day that God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. So that was the significance of the days of unleavened bread in the Old Testament. God delivered the Israelites and brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. They were to eat nothing that had yeast, no leavening agents, no baking powder. They don't know if they had baking powder in those days, but they had yeast and they put it in the flour, in the dough, and then the yeast would cause the dough to rise. But they were not to have that for seven days. They were to just eat bread made with flour and water. And you know, yeast makes it soft and fluffy so that it is palatable. But they had to eat the tough, unleavened bread and hold a festival to the Lord on the first and the seventh day. Not only were they not to eat anything without, with leaven, but they also had to remove the leaven from their camp. So they had to take the leaven and they had to put it outside of the camp, get rid of it, because none was to be found within their borders. And in verse 10 of Exodus 13, they were to observe this at the appointed time. Not every month, not every quarter, not every day, but year after year, according to the instructions of the Lord. Just a few more scriptures to reiterate the timing of the Passover. Leviticus 20, which has all the feast days, tells us that the Passover begins on the 14th, that twilight, again using that term, Ben-Ha Arabi Baim, between the evenings. And on the unleavened bread, the days of unleavened bread, from the 15th, and should be had for seven days. The first and the seventh day are sacred assemblies, which no regular work should be done. In other words, they were high holy days. They were sabbats, high sabbats, which they were to come together, and they were to worship, and they were to have no regular work. Numbers, four, Numbers 9 Another important scripture in the Old Testament which elaborates on the Passover. I want us to bear in mind that Exodus 12 covers the first Passover. They were still in bondage in Egypt. They were understandably constrained in terms of what they could do. So the instructions given in Exodus 12 were very specific. And in Numbers 2, Numbers 9, which was two years after they left Egypt, after wandering the wilderness for two years, the Lord spoke to Moses again and gave them further instructions about the Passover. And in verse 6 to 11, just summarizing, we saw a new instruction. There were some men who were ceremonially unclean when the Passover came around because they were handling dead bodies. And they asked Moses, why should we not be able to take the Passover? with everyone else, even though we are ceremonially unclean. And Moses said, let me inquire from the Lord and get back to you. So Moses inquired from the Lord, and the Lord told Moses that if they are unclean, or if someone is away from the camp, away from Israel, and they were not able to keep the Passover at the appointed time on the 14th of the first month, then there was a second Passover, a second provision on the second month, on the 14th, they could come and they could keep the Passover on the 14th of the second month. So while the appointed time for the Passover is the 14th of the first month or the 14th of Nisan, there was provision for persons who, for circumstances beyond their control, they were able to keep the Passover at a later date on the day that was provided 
or provision on the second month, on the 14th day. But that's important as well. Because it shows that the Passover, initially it was said kept in your homes. Well, it shows that the Passover after a while was centralized. Why? Because it says if someone was on a journey, someone was on a journey, and they weren't able to keep the Passover because they weren't in the camp, then they could keep it on the 14th day of the second month. Repeated the instructions in verse 11, to eat, to roast the lamb, to eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And foreigners could keep it as well, but they had to follow the regulations, which as we saw in Exodus 12, they had to be circumcised. The Passover was a special ceremony. All the other feasts, the Gentiles, the servants, the foreigners could keep along with the Israelites, but the Passover was restricted. It was a special rite, ceremonial rite. You had to come into the covenant body, meaning you had to accept the covenant entry of circumcision before you could observe the Passover. In a very similar way, at the church today, we'll be having Passover in another two weeks, and persons who are not baptized are not allowed to take the emblems, the bread, and the wine, because we saw that the Passover was limited or was restricted to those who accepted the covenant. Of course, no accepting the covenant means being baptized. So the Passover is restricted to baptized members only. And the final scripture I want to look at briefly in the Old Testament is Deuteronomy 16, which in verse 2, it says, it states, that the Passover should be sacrificed at the place that the Lord will choose as a dwelling for his name and not in any of your towns that the Lord will give you. So in other words, you could not keep it where you felt like. So if you lived on the other side of town and the priest decided that, or the inquiring from the Lord, that the Passover should be held at a particular place in the camp or a particular place in the nation, then you would have to bring your lamb there for it to be sacrificed. So the lamb had to be sacrificed at a special place where the Lord has chosen to place his name and not anywhere you feel like. It was not to be in any town. It was to be sacrificed, verse 6, in the evening when the sun goes down on the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. This is again another very important indication of the time that the Passover lamb was sacrificed. In the evening, when the sun goes down, on the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. And who remembers when they departed from Egypt? It was the, the first day of unleavened bread, on the 15th. Now before you look at the timelines in detail, I want to just indicate to us what the symbols, the various symbols and rituals that were conducted by the, by the Israelites around the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread simply um, signifies. There was, of course, the lamb, which was the sacrifice. They had to slaughter the lamb at a particular place. They had to drain the blood. And in the very first Passover, they had to put the blood on the doorpost. And the blood was for the protection of the Israelites. We know that from Hebrews, we know that there's no remission of sin without blood. And the covenants that God entered required blood. So the Passover, the lamb, and the blood from the lamb was painted on the doorpost to separate the Israelites from the Egyptians. And it represented their protection. The unleavened bread, also called the bread of affliction. The bread of affliction was trouble. And for those of us who eat the matzo from year to year, we encounter affliction many times when we eat it. It chips our gum. Sometimes it's very difficult to eat. Very befitting of the word affliction. 
it also signified that they had to leave in a haste. Remember, they were, the dead angel was going to pass through. God told them to get your stuff ready because you're going to have to leave in short order. You didn't have any time to put, put, to, to put yeast in your bread. And when you put yeast in the bread, it's not like it just swell up same time and soften same time. You have to leave it for several hours. They didn't have any time for that. They had to just make the dough, prepare it, and get ready to move. So they could not put any yeast in it. So it says, remember the day of unleavened bread, the unleavened bread, because you left in haste. And of course, leaven means sin. They were to put the leaven out of their camp. The bitter herbs was the bitterness that the Israelites endured during their slavery and bondage in Egypt. Egypt itself was known as the land of sin. It represented, it was a symbol of bondage for the Israelites. And Pharaoh was a type of Satan, who was the one who held them in bondage in the land of sin. In a similar way to how persons are held, it says Satan who leads the whole world astray. Satan has the whole world veiled in the bondage of sin. And Pharaoh represented a type of Satan. Of course, unleavened bread had the consecration of the firstborn, which was them dedicating their firstborn to the Lord. In other words, giving God, putting God first, having the Lord have preeminence in their lives, in their families. So they had to consecrate their firstborn. So these are the rituals, these are some of the symbols that were involved in the first Passover and the meanings. Now I want us to take some time to go through the sequence of events and the timelines of the original Passover in Egypt. Now I remember Pastor doing this a few years ago. He said he had a five-hour presentation. Five-hour presentation, which he tried to condense into two, and it didn't work. I think he ended up doing about three parts. Today, in my limited time, I'm going to attempt to do what he didn't do in one message, to do in a fraction of a message. So I needed to pay keen attention. All right, no sleeping. I'm just going to go through this. I'm going to go through it slowly, but quickly. I'm going to go through it systematically. And I have one advantage. I have PowerPoint. So hopefully the PowerPoint will help us to get the visuals of what was taking place, so I can use less, less words. All right, so here we go. All right, so there are two views. There are two primary views as it relates to when exactly did the Passover events as described in Exodus 12 take place. One, or the first view that I'll discuss is the evening between the 13th and the 14th. In other words, at the beginning of the 14th, we all agree, based on the scriptures, it tells us plainly that the Passover was to be on the 14th. But was it at the beginning of the 14th? Because there was, of course, two evenings. You have the evening beginning the 14th. The day begins at evening. And the day also ends at evening. Or was it the evening ending at the end of the 14th, going into the 15th? Let us go into this. Let's look at the first view which says that the Passover lamb that they were commanded to sacrifice was slaughtered between the evenings. And that's an important term that we'll have to define. Between the evenings of Nisan the 13th and Nisan the 14th. Now what I have here, I'm just explain this before we go into it. This is a timeline. This is a timeline. It's, a, it's blank right now. All right, so the part in yellow, that represents the daylight. And the part in black, that represents the night. Is that clear? Can we all see clearly? All right, so you notice there's some transition between daylight and night. So the part where the yellow is brightest and you have full yellow, that's midday. And the part where you have full black, that's midnight. 
And then the, 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 it, the parts where yellow is transitioning into black, that's, that's sunset. And the part where the black is transitioning to yellow, that's sunrise. That is clear? clear? Excellent. So once you understand that, this is going to be very easy to get. And I won't need five hours. Here we go. And now let's put some dates to it. So this is midday. We're starting at midday on the 13th of nice. And just to label our timeline now. That's midday on the 13th. They have sunset, which ends the 13th and begins the 14th. And now we want to define what between the evenings means from the perspective of those who hold to the 13th, 14th Passover. Now between the evenings are the Hebrew term ben ha arba yai, arba yim. They define it as a tiny window of time when the sun is setting. In other words, after the sunset begins, up to the point that the sun completely disappears. That is what they consider to be between the evenings or twilight. So it's a very, small, a very small window of time, maybe less than an hour, very short. And they believe that that was the time that the Passover lambs were sacrificed. Sunset came on the 13th, ending the 13th. The 14th began because the day begins at sunset. And then as sunset came, they killed the lambs before the sun fully went away. That's what, that's the understanding of between the evenings from the perspective of those who believe in the early 14th Passover. Are we following? I don't hear a lot of you. Show your hands if you're following. All right, I still lost some people because I didn't indicate that they're following. So I'm going to say this one more time. In Exodus, it tells us that the lambs should be sacrificed between the evenings or on twilight of the 14th. Now, if you look here, you have sunset, which ends the 13th, and the 14th begins. And if you go through the black spot, midnight, you come to sunrise, going back into the yellow, bright yellow, midday, then come to the second black spot here. Before you get there, when it's transitioning from yellow, that's, that's sunset on the 14th, going into the 15th. So all of that period there, from sunset here to sunset there, that is the 14th. Passover either occurred on the beginning, the sunset at the beginning, which is to the left, or sunset towards the end, which is closer to the middle here, before you get to the second black spot on the chart. Between the evenings, they say, is when the sun has started to set to when it's completely gone, or when you can no longer get the light from the sun. That is one definition, but let's continue. To look at the sequence of the events. So between the evenings, the Passover lambs are slaughtered and they are roasted. The lambs are eaten the very same night, in haste, as Exodus 12 tells us. So as soon as they finish ro eat, roasting the lambs, time to eat, get your unleavened bread, your bitter herbs, eat it in a haste. Midnight, the 14th of Nisan, the dead angel passes over Egypt. So after they would have eaten in the evening, then they wait until midnight. The dead angel passes over at midnight, as the scripture tells us, and slay the firstborn of the Egyptians. The Israelites are told to hurry and leave. It says, Pharaoh, in the night, Pharaoh said to them, he summoned Moses, he summoned Aaron, and he said, hurry and leave, get out of here, lest all of us die. Then nothing happens. Sunrise comes on the 14th of Nisan. The Israelites do not come out until morning, and after which they start to plunder the Egyptians. There's a, script, there's a verse that says, Moses told them not to come out until morning. So those who hold to the 14th or the early 14th Passover says that they would not have come out at night because they were commanded not to come out until morning. So they came out in the morning after a long night. They plundered the Egyptians. Of course, the Egyptians were very rich. So they needed a lot of time to get all the gold and silver, all the material, clothing. So they took the day. So sunrise, they came out. They took the time. They went to their neighbors. They asked them for things. And then they gathered everything that they had after midday in the evening. And they, they set out. When sunset came on nice on the 15th, 
Then they set out because it tells us specifically, the scripture tells us specifically that they left Egypt on the 15th, on the first day of unleavened bread. So they would not have left until the 15th, even though the dead angel would have passed over from midnight the 14th. Then, of course, midnight the 15th, and so forth. So at this time, they would have left on the sunset, beginning the 15th, having at the Passover, sunset, beginning the 14th, the dead angel passing over midnight, and they would have waited, plundered the Egyptians in the day, throughout the, four, throughout the day of the 14th, and then finally left after that day. Of course, the Passover, as we know from scriptures, is the 14th, so everywhere from sunset to sunset there is the Passover. And then the first day of unleavened bread, when they would have left, would have been on the 15th. So this represents the view of those who hold to the early 14th, or the 13th to 14th Passover. I mean, I say 13th to 14th Passover, I'm talking about the Old Testament Passover. Do we understand this view? All right, excellent. Don't need five hours. The beauty of technology, PowerPoint. Not to say, I, I had to go through those, all those hours in order to understand. So we appreciate, the, that's definitely appreciate that work. Otherwise, it would have been easier, much easier for me to do this. So it is still important to go through those things. But now I want to show the other side of the coin, the other view, which is that the Passover lambs are slaughtered between the evenings, Nisan 14 to 15. In other words, at the end of the 14th, the lambs were slaughtered. Now this is the view of the CGI. So this is actually the view that we hold. We believe that the 14th came, the Israelites waited until in the afternoon. They slaughtered the lambs between the evenings. Then all the events transpired. And let's take it from the timeline. All right, same timeline. Midday, nice and 13. Sunset, nice and 14. So this is the beginning of the 14th. The Passover has begun. The day designated for the Passover has begun, rather. The day, the 14th. Midnight on the 14th, quiet. Sunrise, so wake up in the morning of the 14th. And then we'll have midday and sunset. So I want us now to look at the term between the evening. So the understanding of between the evening in this scenario is the period between midday and when the sun actually sets. So it's a much longer period of time between the evenings. In other words, when the sun starts to go down. So the sun would have been at its peak in the sky at midday. Then it would have started to, to descend or to move away, to descend. So that, is, that going down of the sun, that's what they refer to as between the evenings. So between midday and the actual sunset. That is the period between the evenings, and that's about six hours or so. All right, so understand what, what we mean by between the evenings in this case, right? Following? All right, great. All right, so let's get that away and let's look at the events now. With that understanding, these are the events, the timeline of the events that occurred. Right, so the Passover lamb, lambs were slaughtered and roasted between the evenings, anywhere between midday there and sunset they're slaughtered takes a while to roast lambs can you roast the lamb whole it said roast the lamb the head all the inner parts so they have to roast the whole of lamb they didn't get they didn't cut it up like how oh, i like my lamb chops they had to have it they had to roast it whole took several hours they ate the lamb at the same night so they didn't wait until now. they had to eat the lamb the same night and they had to eat it in a haste no savoring again. All right, so midnight on the 15th. As right, so the sunset has gone, the 15th has begun. So they ate the lamb on the 15th, not on the 14th. But the lambs were slaughtered, importantly, on the 14th. 
The lambs were slaughtered on the 14th, and that's important. And it brings to the fore, what is the Passover? Is the Passover the eating, or is the Passover the actual slain of the lambs? The Passover is the slain of the lambs. So it's not the meal. So it's not so much of when you actually eat the meal, though the meal should be eat before morning. However, it's the slain of the lamb that represents the Passover. So the lambs are slain on the 14th, according to the law, on the Passover. Now midnight on the 15th, the dead angel passes over. The Israelites are told to hurry and leave. Pharaoh summons Moses and says, get out of here. I don't want your people in here anymore. Go and worship your God. Leave us alone, lest we all die. And the Egyptian people join and say, get out of here, leave. The Israelites actually leave in a hurry. So they up and leave. Though it's not yet morning. And we'll have to talk about that. They left. And then, of course, sunrise and midday, the 15th. But there's a challenge here. Right, so the 14th represents the Passover the sunset to sunset here, and the first day of unleavened bread, when the Israelites actually left. When all of those events, the midnight, the dead angel passed, the Israelites hurried and left. Oh, that curtain is blocking there. The Israelites hurried and left. That all happened on the first day of unleavened bread, or on the 15th of Nisan. But there's a challenge. What is missing? The plundering. We have not seen where... The Israelites have plundered the Egyptians. So that's missing. You're looking to see it, it's not there. <laughs> we don't see the plundering. So what happened to the plundering? Well, I put it to you that the plundering actually happened before all of these events. And not after, as Exodus 12 seems to to say or seems to narrate. So the plundering actually happened before. And if we read Exodus 11, verse 2 to 3. And let me just pull that up here. Turn to Exodus 11. Exodus 11, any time now. All right, I'm going to ask our volunteer to read Exodus 11, verse 2 to 3. Do we have a mic? Speak now. Speak now. Yes. In the ears of the people. And let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor. Jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the, in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Okay, thank you very much. So we see even before Moses got the Passover instructions, when the Lord said to him that, I'm going to bring one more plague. This is the last plague, the last of the ten plagues. This is what I want you to do. Go and tell, them, tell, their, tell the people to ask their neighbors for goods. So they were told from before that they were to ask for, for, the, for the possessions. And guess what? God had caused the Egyptians to be favorably disposed towards the Israelites. So they asked. They asked nicely. They didn't scare them with the death of their firstborn. They asked, and God caused them to be favorably disposed towards them. Doesn't suggest that they were extorted or scared into giving it away. The people felt kind towards them and gave them these possessions. 
their possessions and things. Yet in Exodus 12, we see that plundering. So I want us to look at verse 35. Verse 35, coming down to verse, verse 35 and verse 36. Brother Miller, of Exodus 12. Exodus 12, verse 35 and verse 36. Testing. He's there now. And the children of Israel did according to the words of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they learned they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. All right. So yet, after the, the Israelites were told to leave, we see this plundering here. But I put it to you that what this is actually saying is that the persons, it's, Moses is simply narrating what would have happened after, from Exodus 11, he would have instructed them to plunder. So he was looking back and saying that the Israelites had asked the Egyptians, they'd done what he had instructed and asked the Egyptians, their neighbors, for articles of gold and silver and clothing. And the Lord had made them favorably disposed towards the people and they had given them what they had asked for and they had plundered the Egyptians. So the plundering happened from before. So there was no need for them to plunder when they were supposed to be leaving in a haste. They didn't stop to plunder at that time. And this makes sense. But there are some good reasons, I admit, for an early 14th or 13th to 14th Passover um, reckoning. There are some good reasons. Of course, the premise, is, the premise is that between the evenings is a short window of time between sunset and the full appearance of and the full disappearance of the sun. Unfortunately, I cannot take any questions. I have a very short time to do this presentation. I have a long way to go. I was going to ask you to write it down, and if I can take it at the end, then I will do so. All right, so first point. The thing about the 14th that makes it a very palatable view is that all the events would have happened on the 14th. So from the slaying of the lamb at the beginning to the passing of the dead angel, midnight, to the plundering, the eating of the meal, of course, before that, all of that would have happened on the 14th. And it seems like all of that is involved in the Passover. So it's a whole lot more, it's, a whole lot, it's, it's cleaner, it's more palatable if everything happened on the 14th, as, we, as the first view depicted. The second point is that all the other holy days that we observe, including the weekly Sabbath, they are observed from, the, from sunset, that's the beginning of the day, and not at the end, as we see in the 14th to 15th view, where we see only when sunset was approaching, they carried out the Passover sacrifice. But when we think about Sabbath, we start Sabbath from the sunset ending the sixth day to the 17th. Just the, so they are saying in a similar way, Passover is the 14th, they say Passover starting from ending the day, ending the 13th, and, the day be, and beginning the 14th. So that's another point that is used to support the early 14th Passover. Another one is that Moses told, told the Israelites not to go out until morning. We see that clearly in Exodus 12, verse 22. And yet, Deuteronomy 16, verse 1 told us that they left by night. So how do we address this contradiction? They are saying that they left at night the following day. So in other words, when the dead angel passed at midnight, they stayed in their homes, slept. The next day would have come, daylight would have come, morning would have come, they could have gone out, do the plundering, and then left at the following night because they could not have left the same night because they were told not to leave until morning. 
So that's another point that is used to support the early 14th Passover. Another one is that it would take a long time for so many people, and it was approximately 2 million people who had to leave Egypt. It's no small feat to lead out 2 million people out of somewhere. Just a few weeks ago, we tried to evacuate this hall of about 200 people, and the time it took to get everyone out, and the time it took to get everyone out, just imagine it was two million people. Would need a few days to actually get people out. So that supports what they are talking about. And we saw it in a very tangible way recently. So it needed a long time for two million people to leave. They plundered the Egyptians the following morning. I already explained that one. They needed some time to plunder the Egyptians. Therefore, the Passover was had on the four, early 14th. They could use the, four, the entire day of the 14th, plunder the Egyptians, and then get the two million people and leave. Jesus, it is said, and his disciples had the Passover at the beginning of the 14th. We see that in Matthew 26, verse 17 to 18. And we also see it in Mark chapter 14, verse 12 to 15. Jesus, when the, before the day of unleavened bread, Jesus' his disciples asked him, where should we go and prepare the Passover? This was the day ending the 13th, heading into the 14th. We know it couldn't be the following day because Jesus was dead. Therefore, this had to be from the start of the 14th. That was when the disciples asked him, where should they prepare the Passover? That's another strong argument for the early 14th Passover. Another one is that Passover was done domestically. Therefore, the lamb could be killed and roasted in a very short time. Now remember Exodus 12, they're in Egypt. Each family was to choose their own lambs, choose their own animals. They would share it with their neighbor if it was a small family and they were to do that sort of do the, the, the slaughtering of the lamb and they were to have it as a family. Well that was in Egypt. That was the very first Passover. As I showed in Numbers 9 two years later God gave some more instructions regarding the Passover. And in Deuteronomy 16, it says clearly that you cannot have it anywhere. You had to bring it to the place that the Lord would place his name. Therefore, the Passover, though claim it was done domestically, was not always so. The Old Testament Passover, certainly, though the first one was done domestically, the Old Testament pastor, Passover was done, Passover was done Centrally, though nothing turns on this point because we still try to find out the timeline for the first one. And the claim is that the Jewish practice, because the Jews today observe the 14th going into the 15th, they are saying that that is a corrupted observance. In other words, when they went into exile, they, and they came back out of exile, they no longer observed the Passover as it was originally given they started to keep it towards the end instead of at the beginning as they were, would have been instructed by Moses. Now these are the arguments for our early 14th Passover, which is not our view, by the way, just to reiterate that. But there are also some important points against the early 14th Passover. One of those are This was the first Passover, as I mentioned. It was domestic. They didn't, have a center of, uh, they didn't have a central place to go. This was a specific instruction for a specific instance. And they were given further instructions later on in the law, Deuteronomy 16, as I mentioned before, where they are told to bring it to a central place. We see that repeated in 2 Chronicles 35, verse 1 to 2, and verse 10 as well. We also see that in 2 Chronicles verse 30, Chapter 30, verse 1. The lamb was to be brought to the priest, and the priest is the one who would do the sacrificing. There were a lot of people, hence there would have been a lot of lambs, a lot of families, and the few priests that were designated had to be slaughtering lambs and so forth. 
So that could not have been done in the small window of time that they claim between the evening and tails, which is just after the sun has set and before the sun completely disappears. So that's a powerful point against the early, pass, or early 14th Passover. It would take a long time. Could not be done between the evenings. And the obvious question is, why would they eat it in a haste? If they, and, be, and, and, and told to be ready to leave with their sandals on their feet, their belt tucked, their staff in hand, if they, were, if they were going to wait another 18 hours before they were to leave. Just simply doesn't add up. Why? Now let's look at some of the arguments for the late 14th heading into the 15th Passover. For one, this is the popular understanding of the term Ben Ha Arbaim by Jewish scholars and historians that it is the 14th, ending the 14th, going into the 15th. That's what they understand. Sorry, they, that's what they understand. They understand the term to be between, between the evenings to be from noon going towards sunset. So that's the more popular view. Two, Jesus himself observed the Jewish Passover. Jesus himself, we see several times in scriptures, he observed the Jewish Passover. And for some references, you can look at Luke 2, verse 41 to 43. Also John chapter 2, verse 13. And he never corrected them on the day, saying that you guys are keeping the Passover at the wrong time. You need to be keeping it at the beginning of the 14th. But yet he went up and he observed it with the Jews. If Jesus did it at this time, then chances are this was when, this was when it was supposed to be done. Third point, Deuteronomy 16, verse 6 tells us that it was to be done in the evening when the sun goes down on the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. And I ask again, what is the anniversary of the Israelites' departure from Egypt? The 15th, the first day of unleavened bread, they left the 15th. That is the anniversary. I said they will, you must do it on the evening when the sun goes down on the anniversary of their departure from Egypt, suggesting that it was to be done when the sun goes down, or when the sun is going down on the 14th, going into the anniversary of the, of the day beginning the 15th, when they actually left Egypt. The Passover was central, and it would take a lot of time to kill the lambs. Israelites were to eat it in a haste. Why? Because they had to be ready to leave at a moment's notice, as we saw. Another point that strongly supports a late 14 Passover is that the events are tightly bounded to the days of unleavened bread. They're inseparable, both chronologically and symbolically. And I want us to read Deuteronomy 16 because it's so important. Verse 1 to 8. Deuteronomy 16, verse 1 to 8. It says, Observe in the month of Aviv, that's the first month, and celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God. Because in the month of Aviv, he brought you out of Egypt by night. Sacrifice as the Passover to the Lord your God, an animal from your flock or herd at a place that the Lord chooses as a dwelling for his name. Do not eat it with bread made with yeast, but for seven days eat unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, because you left Egypt in haste. Now we see them talking about Passover, eating the Passover with unleavened bread. And all of a sudden, he's saying, in the same sentence, do not eat it with bread made with yeast, but for seven days, eat unleavened bread. And we know that he's talking about the days of unleavened bread. So we are seeing a clear continuation in terms of eating unleavened bread. 
with the Passover meal and going into the seven days of unleavened bread. So the clear continuation there, suggesting that because outside of the Passover meal on the 14th, it says you should not eat unleavened bread from the 15th going into the seven days ending on the 21st. So why is it that we see this continuation here? If they had it at the beginning of the 14th, not commanded not to eat unleavened bread, only, only with that meal they were not to eat unleavened bread on the 14th. They could eat leavened bread on the 14th, but it's only with the Passover meal that they were not to have unleavened bread on the 14th. And yet we see this clear continuation in verse 3, saying, do not eat it with bread made with leaven, but for seven days eat unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. So we see a clear continuation of the eating of the Passover meal and the days of unleavened bread. No break in between in terms of the eating, breaking to eat some leavened bread and then coming back to eat unleavened bread. So they're eating it going into the 15th from the end of the 40 with the meal. And finally, Ramesses was in Goshen. So a big point is made about where the Israelites left from. So they were staying in the region of Goshen. They weren't in Egypt proper. They were staying in a region called Goshen. But yet we see when they were told to leave, they left from Ramesses and they went to a place called Succoth, which was back near the Red Sea. Just to show us that geographically, those who say that the Passover had to be on the early 14th because they needed the time in the day of the 14th so that they could move and get everybody from Goshen to Ramesses so that they could leave from Ramesses to Succoth. And this is the map. So in this region here where the circle is about to appear, we have Ramesses, we have Goshen, which was the region, the general region, and we have Succoth. So they, we see Goshen there between Ramesses, and we see Succoth towards the Red Sea. That sea there is the Red Sea, the one to the bottom of the map. So they left from Ramesses, which was in the region of Goshen, and they went to Succoth. Succoth. So they didn't need time to move from Goshen to go to Ramesses in order to move to Succoth, because Ramesses was already in Goshen. That's the point that are wanted to make. There are some challenges with the late 14th Passover. One, you see some of the observances, some of the events carrying over into the 15th, which they say is a challenge because the Passover is the 14th. All of the Passover should be in the 14th. Why should some events, why should the eating be on the 15th when the slain is on the 14th? doesn't suggest that it's, it's not following the law which says the Passover is the 14th. But then again, what is the Passover? The Passover is just the sacrifice. So once the sacrifice is done on the 14th, between the evenings, then it is met. The criteria is met. It doesn't matter that they didn't have the meal on the 14th, that they had the meal going into the 15th. So it's a sacrifice that is the Passover and not the eating of the meal. Another argument against it is that they left at night. And yet, Moses told them not to go out until morning. So if they left on the night of the 15th, they would have been disobeying Moses' command or Moses', Moses instruction not to leave until morning. There would have been a clear violation. That angel would have passed at midnight. Then all of a sudden, they would have been leaving out at night, while it was still dark, according to Deuteronomy 16, verse 1, though Moses told them not to go out until morning. Therefore, this poses a challenge. They could not have left out on the same night that, Moses, that they, these events happened, that Moses told them not to go out. Well, is that really so? Think about it. Once the dead angel had passed, then it was okay for them to go out. In fact, the scriptures tell us that Moses and Aaron went out to Pharaoh. So they themselves went to Pharaoh when they were summoned in Exodus 12, verse 31. Another point to note is that morning doesn't always mean 
daylight. There's a difference. Of course, we say one o'clock in the morning now. It's still dark, but it's, but it's morning. So they're told not to go out until morning. They weren't told not to go out until daylight. And we see examples in scriptures where it refers to a, a, poor, a poor portion of time as being morning, yet it was dark. For example, we see this in Ruth 3, verse 14. And I won't turn there in the interest of time. But Ruth went to lay down at Boaz's feet. And it was morning, but yet they could not recognize each other because it was dark. Jesus, in Mark 1, verse 35, he went out in the morning, but yet it was still dark. Therefore, morning is not synonymous with daylight. Morning is simply the early part of the day. So the Israelites obeyed Moses. They stayed in. Midnight passed. The dead angel passed over. They were in their homes. Moses went out to Pharaoh at night. And then he come, came back and told them, it's time for us to go. And they left at night, according to Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. What about the objection? No time to plunder the Egyptians before they left. I already dealt with that. They plundered them before the 14th. So there was no need to plunder the Egyptians um, when, they were, when they needed to leave in a haste. They had already done so from Exodus 11, as we saw there. Jesus observed the Passover, that final Passover, even though he observed all the other Passovers with the Jews. 14 going into 15. He observed the Passover at the correct time, one would say, at the early 14th. But there's a reason why Jesus had to observe it early on that day, on, at that, that occasion. What's the reason? He was going to die. He was going to be crucified. He would not be alive when the Jews were eating the Passover come the 15th. Therefore, he brought them together. So I, eagerly await, I, I eagerly desired to have this Passover with you. He, Jesus Christ, he was to be the Passover lamb. He was to be the one who was going to be slain on the 14th between the evenings to fulfill the scriptures. Turn with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15. There are some other references, but I'll stay with one. Mark 15, verse 33 to 36. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the Passover. He is our Lamb of God. He is the Passover Lamb who was slain for our sins. And he was slain at the exact time that the Passover Lambs were being slain. The Old, the, 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 the old Covenant, or the, the Old Covenant, we'll call it the Old Covenant, that the Israelite Passover Lambs were being slain. Between the evenings, as the scriptures tell us, he was crucified about three o'clock. It says between the sixth hour and the ninth hour. The sixth hour being the sixth hour of light from sunrise being 12 o'clock. And then the ninth hour being the ninth hour from sunrise, which is about three o'clock. Jesus Christ, it, told, it tells us in Mark 15, he died around three o'clock, which would have been the time that the lambs were being Kill. And finally, Jesus did not have the traditional Passover meal. On that occasion, on the early 14th, Jesus instituted a whole new covenant, Passover, on that very night. It was not the traditional Passover, Passover meal. And this brings us to our next section. But I just want to conclude. The Passover sacrifice was done on the afternoon of Nisan 14th, before sunset. The meal was eaten after sunset on Nisan the 15th. Of course, the Passover sacrifice was kept or was done on the 14th according to the law. The meal was not the Passover but it was the sacrifice that was the Passover. And now, I want us to look quickly at the New Testament Passover, which we also refer to as the Lord's Supper, as well as unleavened 
bread. Now, Jesus Christ instituted some new symbols. But he, while he walked on earth, he observed the traditional Jewish Passover up until his death. And we see this in Luke chapter 2 and John chapter 2. He brought some new symbols with new meanings and left them with his disciples for them to continue going forward on the night that he was betrayed. One, of, one such symbol was the foot washing ceremony. And it symbolized humility and service. We see this in John chapter 3. On the night that Jesus was going to be crucified, that Jesus was going to be betrayed to be crucified, the disciples started to fight amongst one, one, another, and quarrel, one another and quarrel. Who is going to be the greatest? And Jesus had to call them together and say, no. The one, if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. You have to serve one another. Humility, which is an important theme of the Passover. So as we go into this Passover, each of us need to assess ourselves. Do we have any attitude of pride? Any attitude of vanity? Any attitude of unwarranted superiority? Meaning that we believe that we are superior in and of ourselves. That we are the greatest. The best thing since sliced bread. Then we need to get rid of that leavened bread. And to take in the unleavened bread of humility. So Jesus instituted the foot washing ceremony on that night. And we can see that account in John chapter 13. He also gave them the symbol of the bread. Which is his body as he explained in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, which was broken for you. So Jesus Christ was broken for us. Isaiah 53 speaks about the suffering that he was to go through, the lamb. He says he went like a lamb to be slaughtered. Again, we see Jesus being the lamb. To be slaughtered, to be broken for us. The bread, the unleavened bread, which we will have on the Passover, represents his body, which was broken for us. And the wine represents his blood. As we see on the night, Jesus poured out the wine and said, drink this wine. This is my blood, which is spilled, which is poured out for you. His blood, the wine represents his blood, which was spilled to cleanse our sins. So these were the symbols that Jesus left. In that final Passover night, as he was about to end his mission here on earth. What about the New Testament church? After Jesus had died and ascended, the New Testament church continued with their observance of the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. We see this account in Acts chapter 12, when Paul when the Jews, rather, sees Peter, and it says that this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, this is Luke, who is writing to a Gentile diplomat. He's writing him this account, and he is making reference to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because they were still observing the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were... They brought him out for public trial after the Passover. Again, more reference to the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now what had happened, they had, rec they had begun to recognize it as really one feast, even though there's a Passover first and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because they observed the Passover right going into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they referred to the whole time as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But it's really talking about the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We also see in Acts 20, in the account of Luke, he said, they say, we sail from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Again, we see that they were observing the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, in chapter 5, you can make a note of verse 6 to 8, where he says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? 
Again, Paul is using the symbolism of leaven, which he would have gotten from his understanding of the days of unleavened bread, to speak to the New Testament church. And he says to them, Get rid of the old yeast, so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ Jesus, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread of bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul, in his writing this letter, shows us that the Corinthian church, the, the primitive church, was still observing the days of unleavened bread. You can also make a note of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, and chapter 11. The New Testament church did not observe Easter. They did not observe any festival called Easter, but they continued in the tradition observing what Jesus observed, which was the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. They observed it once per year at the appointed time. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass unto you, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and he gave, it, gave thanks, and he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So in other words, on the anniversary of Jesus' betrayal, on the night that he was betrayed, as Paul writes, you do this in remembrance of me. So we don't take the Lord's Supper every Sabbath when we come here. We don't take it every month end. We do not take it every quarter. But we observe it annually on the 14th of Nisan, the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed. Now what do these New Testament symbols represent? Well, one, Jesus is the Passover. He is the Passover. A very person said Jesus is the Sabbath. But guess what? Jesus is the Passover. Jesus is the Lamb of God. In John 1 verse 9, when John saw him come, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, the one who comes. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul refers to him, Jesus Christ, as the Lamb or Passover. Jesus, our Passover, was slain. So Jesus, he, as the symbolism, he is the Passover. Jesus washes his disciples' feet, yet he was the teacher, he was the master. He said, you call me master, yet I wash your feet. Therefore, you should do these things, and when you do them, you'll be blessed. And the washing of the feet represents humility and service. We see that in John chapter 13. Jesus again. He is the bread. The bread represents his body. In John 6, chapter 51, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. Hallelujah. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Jesus Christ, he, the symbol of the bread, represents Jesus Christ and his body, the living bread which came down from heaven. Jesus again, the wine, his blood, his shed blood for our sins. And Jesus said to them in John 6, verse 53, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real, fruit, real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh... And drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. The Passover symbols continue. Unleavened bread. Leaven represents sin. As we see Paul indicating in his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5. He says, put out 
Put out the leaven. Put out the leaven of pride. And have the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In other words, put out sin, which is what we are called to do. That is what it means when we put leaven out of our homes. The Israelites were commanded to put leaven out of their borders. Not only were they to eat unleavened bread and not to eat anything leaven, they had to put leaven out of their cities. So it is, we are to put leaven out of our lives. So as we eat the unleavened bread, during the days of unleavened bread, let it not just be a ritual, but let us consider that we are called to a life of righteousness. We are called to walk in, in the spirit, no longer walking to the flesh, giving in to its desires. So let us put away sin out of our lives. Having taken in the unleavened bread of Christ, having accepted the sacrifice, having accepted the blood, the wine, we put out leaven, we put out sin. Jesus Christ, he is the unleavened bread. So for the seven days, when we eat the bread, we are putting in Christ, we are taking in Christ. His sinlessness, leaven represents sin. The bread, unleavened bread, sinlessness. Christ alone is perfect. We take in the perfect Christ, the unleavened bread. He is our righteousness. When that day comes, God won't see our imperfect unrighteousness. Do you see the righteousness of Christ? And finally, practically, how do we observe the festivals today? Well, for one, sunset on Nisan the 14th, which will be March the 29th this year, will be the Passover. We'll have a solemn assembly. We will gather at Michael. I believe we're starting at 7 o'clock. We usually get there early, so we try to get there at least half an hour before so that we are all not crumbling at the same time and causing a lot of noise. It was a, it's a solemn occasion. So we remain quiet. We meditate on the sacrifice of Christ, on the suffering of Christ, and we gather and we sit quietly and we wait for the service to begin. The first activity that we partake in, we will wash each other's, each other's feet, feet. As Christ gave the example to his disciples on that last night, he washed their feet and he said, do this. As I have done for you, you should do. So we continue in that tradition of Christ and we wash each other's feet. The men will wash the feet of the men and the women wash the feet of the women. Then we eat the broken matzo or the unleavened bread which represents the broken body of Christ. And we will drink a small bit of wine, not a lot, which represents his shed blood for us. Then on the 14th, or before the 14th, we'll have put leaven out of our homes. So we need to get rid of the bread, get rid of the crackers, get rid of the baking soda, baking powder. And then the night to be much observed. We still observe and re remember what happened at the first Passover in Egypt, which is why we continue the tradition of the 15th, the night to be much observed. And we have a fellowship meal. This year will be decentralized in the homes. <clears throat> And then we gather for service on the 15th, which will be the 31st. Of course, there's an offering. You have to remember the offering collection on the high holy days. And then on the seventh day, we also gather for the holy convocation, and there will be a collection of offering. So in summary, the Old Testament Passover, nice on the 14th, heading into the 15th, that's when those events occurred, as we saw from the evidence provided. The days of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat bread made without leaven. Nice and 15th to the 21st. And the, all of this represents Israel's redemption from bondage in Egypt, which represents the land of sin. The New Testament Passover, we have it at nice and 14th, at the beginning. Why? 
because that's when Jesus instituted the new symbols. And Paul said, on the night that he was betrayed, we do this in remembrance of him. So we do it on the early 14th, the night that Christ was betrayed. Because Jesus is our Passover. He has replaced the lamb. Jesus is our unleavened bread. And we accept Jesus' sacrifice. We put sin out of our lives. And we take in the unleavened bread of Christ. Brethren, I hope that we have a truly special season of unleavened bread. And I hope that we have truly transformed lives going forward. And that this feast will indeed be a platform for our continuous development, our continuous character development as we look forward to the kingdom of God. Amen.